Well, welcome everyone to Your Graham Coach, the podcast. We are so excited to let you know that our podcasts are now on YouTube as well as hearing it audio. So go over to YouTube, like this video and subscribe so you can get the weekly uh, episode updates. Now, today we're continuing our conversation on the type ones, the principal reformers, and we actually are going to interview three type ones today. So in this episode, you're going to see how type ones share the same core motivations and their EIP parts, but we also want you to see how they're different. We're we're not all the exact same. So we want to hear from their unique stories and how their core motivations affect them and their EIP parts and how each of them show up. Well, before we introduce our guests, if you're hearing EIP and don't know what we're talking about, (laughs) please go check out episode 112. There, we fully explain our new proprietary Enneagram concept called the Enneagram Internal Profile, or EIP for short. If you want to know more about Type 1s, you can also listen to Episode 117, where we do a deep dive into Type 1s and their EIP. So, Beth, why don't we start off with, why don't you explain, give us a brief description of EIP? Yeah. So, in the Bible, God is focusing on our heart condition. And the Enneagram brings that awareness and that clarity to where our heart is at any particular moment. Are we aligned or are we misaligned with the truth of the gospel? And EIP, we use the Enneagram internal profile to help us to understand our heart condition and the various parts of our hearts and how they're showing up in any given moment. So your main type has two parts within it. You have the misaligned wounded child and the gospel-led beloved child. Now, again, you can go back to episode 112 to really get to understand what these parts are, but we also have four other parts comprised of the connecting types. Those are your two wings and the two Enneagram paths. Those are the two types you're connected to in the lines in the Enneagram symbol. Now, each of these parts can show up in your life, again, either aligned or misaligned, and it's depending on is your wounded child or your beloved child leading your team or your internal world. So what's really helpful is that using EIP can help you to become aware of your heart condition. And when your wounded child is in the lead, we want you to know that it is trying to be helpful. It has positive intent. It's trying to keep you from being hurt and wounded. But because it has very few resources and it's ill-equipped, it actually is, can bring about some really negative uh, tendencies that can harm you and your relationships. So we want to know this to surrender our heart and depend on the Holy Spirit to bring back the truth of who we are so that our beloved child who knows, believes, and trusts our identity in Christ, that that beloved child will show up and lead our entire heart and all the parts that are in it. Now, parts is kind of an interesting term, but we all have, you know, experienced this. Like, you know, we'll say, well, part of me wants to do this, but part of me wants to do that. Or, you know, part of me feels angry, but part of me is like, okay. And part of me is grieving, but part of me sees some joy in this process. So we have lots of competing parts within us, and we're going to unpack that for you. So you have a fuller understanding of what these parts look like. Now, When your beloved child shows up, it can bring the truth of the gospel to your entire part of your heart so that the fruits of the spirit show up. So joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, and self-control all are showing up to express who God created you to be to everyone. So, well, today on our show, we have three type ones. You're going to love these people. Uh, First off is Vanessa Sadler. Uh, She is a trauma-informed spiritual director and Enneagram practitioner. She offers her clients an integrated story work, which includes a cultural identity component. Vanessa, thanks so much for joining us uh, on today's episode. Thanks so much. It's good to be with you guys again. Yeah. Hey, Vanessa. Now, Vanessa, when was it that you got uh, introduced to the Enneagram? How long ago was that? Oh, man. It's it's going on a decade, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. I'm kind of charting it by, we have a teenager. He's, he just turned 13 a couple of weeks ago. And so I feel like I can kind of chart it by how old he was when he started. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it's going on yep, 10 that's years. Right. Yeah. How fun. Well, next up is Brian Lee. Brian Lee is the founder of Gospel Centered Enneagram and is a veteran pastor of over 20 years. You can find both Vanessa and Brian in our coaches directory at myenneagramcoach.com. Hey, Brian, thanks for joining us for the episode. Thanks so much for having me on. It's good to be here. 
And Brian also works at YAC for quite a bit of hours, helping us to do, I mean, just about everything under the sun. I mean, I... Functioning <laughs> as a one in all of its glory. Oh, man, it's so amazing. <laughs> like, he came up with this spreadsheet spreadsheet chart. No one asked him, like, or told him how to do it, and it is remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> remarkable. We, we might have to get into it, because we had a great conversation about creating yes. it, and um, yes, Brian, if I'm not mistaken, like there's a tendency to move into spaces where help is needed. Reform. To reform. Correct. It, yeah. yeah. And improve. Ah, yes. oh, so <laughs> needed. Right. Thank you so much. And we were talking about whether or not he wants to do that or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Well, um, the next person uh, that's joining us is Jill Savage. She is a speaker and author of 14 books, including No More Perfect Moms and No More Perfect Marriages. She also hosts the popular No More Perfect podcast. Uh, Jill, thanks so much for joining us. And we have had the joy of getting to know you over the past couple of years. And uh, you you remind us of how awesome ones are. Um, <laughs> and but, but it is interesting, the title of your books, as we were talking about a little bit before the show, were re- really related to yep. your type yeah. oneness. And your journey, right? Right. And my journey uh, to move from that um, unhealthy side to the healthy side. And that's really yes. uh, where that came from. Yeah. Uh, tell us about type ones. So just to give kind of a brief overview. So type ones are conscientious, they're sensible, ethical, responsible, idealistic, serious, self-disciplined, and very orderly. Um, they are personally feel like they're obligated to improve themselves and the world. And internally, what we want to recognize about type ones is they struggle to believe that they are worthy or good enough because they have this inner critic and it's like a megaphone right at their ear that constantly is accusing them or pointing out imperfections. Um, and they're just looking to kind of bring the volume of that inner critic down to silence it um, or turn it off completely. And so they're striving to do what is right, not make any mistakes, and hopefully everyone else will follow in, in the same suit so that inner critic will just stop. In fact, their focus of attention is really seeing errors, mistakes, and problems, and then fixing them. Now, what people think is ones are walking around trying to find imperfections and tell everyone to do it right. That's actually not what's happening. The imperfections leap out at them and assault them. And so when uh, the imperfections grab the attention of the one, there's a visual reaction with inside them, and they can't relax or let up until it's resolved, whether they resolve it or someone else. And so you'll see the type ones either themselves trying to get everything just right, um, or they're trying to get everyone else in line to get it just right. So hopefully this inner critic will just calm down and stop berating them so much. I think it's really important for us to see the type one from that lens. Cause I think a lot of people think, oh, they're just out to, to judge or see the imperfections. And it's like, guys, if you just understood how much they're experiencing internally from this inner critic, you're just getting a thimble size of that. Um, and so that allows us to have compassion and understanding and to ask clarifying questions and come alongside the ones um, and kind of come together. Maybe not do everything that's on their list because their lists never end, right, guys? The <laughs> inner critic has a billion things that could be fixed. But how can we come together and show the ones that we under- we see that they have this pain and this burden? But what's really great is that type ones are so amazing that they have a wisdom and balance. They're kind, they're respectful. They can be very compassionate and action oriented to serve the worlds. And when they're at their best, they're patient and have integrity. They know how to love well, but make sure things are done right. And so we're so thankful for the type ones when they are at this level to demonstrate Christ likeness, because not only are they principled, but they're patient. They're responsible, but they're also empathetic with others. So what we want to do is before we jump in, because we want to ask you guys um, as a panel um, how your type one has showed up, but I want to just cover the core motivations of the type one, because this is why you all think, feel, and behave in particular ways. And so it's important that we get to this component to kind of break it down a little bit further. So Now, when we talk about EIP, which we're going to talk about different parts of our heart and the different types that we're connected to and influence the type one, we want to recognize that it's your main type's core motivation that reigns supreme. So for the type ones, your core fear is being wrong, 
bad, evil, inappropriate, unredeemable, or corruptible. Now, your desire is to have integrity, to be good, balanced, ethical, virtuous, and right. But you struggle with the core weakness of resentment. Now, resentment here means that you're repressing anger that leads to continual frustration and dissatisfaction with yourselves, others, and the world for not being perfect. Now, you long to hear, so your core longing is to hear you are good. So type ones, we would just love to hear which parts of all that I just described, what, what, which parts of it are you like, oh, yes, that's me. Just describe a little bit further what that is and how that really lands on you and where it's coming from. You know, definitely the perfection uh, issue for me has been um, probably one of the biggest ones that I've had to tackle um, as a type one. And um, in my books, my No More Perfect books, I call it the perfection infection. So um, the perfection infection is when we have unrealistic expectations of ourselves and when we unfairly compare ourselves to others and it just drives us. And um, that's, uh, I think all of us struggle with it to some degree, but as a one, I've come to understand that it's, it's, it's even bigger and that is um, a, uh, a huge challenge. And as I have gotten more healthy um, and, and begun to root out the perfection infection in my life, I found a lot more contentment um, and the ability to give myself grace, to give others grace um, along the way. But for sure, that was a big one for me. Um, Jill, how did it show up in your relationships? Uh, critical spirit. Um, I often would um, have a, you know, I just had this, because there's just this natural maximizer um, in inside of me where I can see um, what is needed to improve things, um, which is great when you lead an organization, not so good when you're married. (laughs) 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 And the one that you want to improve is the one that you're married to or Mm -hmm. your children. Um, you know, you're, you're a mother. And, um, and so that I would say that it probably, uh, came out in that, and also, there just was a, har- a harsh side of me um, that there was a harshness about my communication as well, not a lot of grace. And as I have moved from that wounded place to the beloved place, I've certainly increased that as well. Um, when, uh, let's say, family members would have reflected back, like, hey, mom, that felt a little overly critical, how would you have heard it at that time? There was there were two parts of that. Um, mm-hmm. On one side, I, I, I was list, I was hearing what they were saying, and I was understanding that there was a very black and white side of me, and it was not always conducive to healthy relationships. And so I I wanted to hear that, and I could receive that. On the mm-hmm. other side, um, I just wanted them to get up to perfection so we could all be done with this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vanessa and Brian are totally agreeing with yeah. you right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I hear from a lot of ones um, that they just, they sometimes don't even get it. They don't feel like they're coming across as harsh or controlling or critical as maybe others are responding to them. And in fact, a lot of ones are like, I'm just trying to help. I'm just giving advice or I'm just trying to improve things. Does that resonate with you at all? Yes. And for me, um, I also felt like they were entirely too sensitive. Uh (laughs) (laughs) That's such a bold line. (laughs) You're like, ooh, yeah, yeah, okay. I see where you're at. I I smell what you're stepping in. Yeah, type ones are very logical. Like, this is the right way to do it. Um, and Vanessa and Brian, what about you guys? What was it that uh, really, when you found out that you were one, what really stood out to you and why was it that helpful for you? Uh, well, I'm just sitting here listening to this conversation and and really realizing again and again, not for the first time, but just re-remembering yeah. that 
even the comment that you made, Jill, about, I just feel like you're being too sensitive, comes from this place of, oh, you don't understand what I'm dealing with, with this critic that's going on constantly in my head. And so you really are only getting a thimble full <laughs> of what I'm, const- what I'm constantly hearing mm-hmm. toward myself often um, throughout the day. And so, yeah, I think... Again, for me, discovering that I was a type one was very parts based. Like part of me was so thankful. I have language now for what's actually going on internally and what's motivating some of these behaviors or choices or feelings that I have, you know, coming up or the visceral visceral reactions that you're talking about. I always felt like I could see this is a, a really terrible example and I'm not trying to throw my spouse under the bus but uh (laughs) like I would always feel like I see things that other people don't so if he makes dinner and he makes macaroni and cheese we have white cabinets in our kitchen I would see the splashes of the cheese of the cheese on the cabinet and nobody else was because he's like in there and letting the kids help and they're making a mess and I'm all for that if you clean it up but I'd be the only one that would see the splashes of cheese left over. Um, And I would be the only one who was like task over, I'm task over relationship or task over people is my default, right? If I'm not um, Mm -hmm. really consciously thinking about, okay, if I make this comment right now, is that going to take out my seven-year-old, my nine-year-old or my 13-year-old, right? Uh, So coming back to being super task over, over, people. But then there was also part of me that I joke with you guys. I've joked with you guys before that when I found out I was a type one, I kind of immediately went to my four place of mourning. <laughs> it was yeah. like, oh mm-hmm. God. And yeah. that and person. Why, why is that? Oh, I'm awful to be around sometimes. Like if I'm honest, right? Um I'm so grateful to have language. And then I also feel like there's this line in The Runaway Bride with Richard Mm -hmm. Gere and Julia Roberts, where she's like, I think there's the distinct possibility that I am profoundly and irreversibly screwed up. Uh And that's like exactly where I would go to. And then I would also feel like as a parent, Jill, coming back to even one of your books, like No Perfect Parents, normal perfect parents that I was then messing up my kids. Right. So if mm-hmm. I'm task over relationship all the time, then I am being too critical. I am being too harsh. Um, and so you can start to see the spiral that starts to happen, right? My critics telling me this and I'm feeling this and I'm seeing this and I'm feeling this. Um, but it wasn't really until um, I started seeing my own spiritual director and understanding the Enneagram a little bit more that there's that grace of, I actually don't have the power to screw myself up. I don't have that level of power um, mm-hmm. to, to make that kind of judgment and profoundly and irreversibly screwed up in myself or in my kids. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's. Well, one thing that I want to draw attention to. Uh, so Jill, you're married to nine. Uh, mm-hmm. Vanessa is married to a two, I believe. And then Brian is married to a three, which has its, each have its, its own dynamics and different ways of feedback. Um, I would imagine, you know, for Brian, like, uh, maybe your, your spouse isn't as messy, maybe in the kitchen that maybe like a nine or two spouse might be. <laughs> and, um, but it, uh, Brian, what about for you, uh, just briefly, and then we'll move on to some other stuff about EIP, but what was it that really caught your attention when you first realized you were a one? Yeah, I really appreciate what Jill and Vanessa have shared, and it's a lot of the same stuff. I think having a new language for the way that I was, um, and not as an excuse to defend what I had been doing, but I think the biggest wake up moment was seeing myself the way other people must have seen me and experienced Mm -hmm. me. And I think that's what kind of hurt the most. Um, you know, I, I have often been told how arrogant I am or how I come across and it's, and my initial and immediate defense was always, but I'm not, I'm just trying to help you. 
mm. or I'm mm-hmm. not. I just know. <laughs> right. It's just, <laughs> right. I'm right. I know I'm, I'm right. I'm just right. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that coming across, and you know, I forget if this was before we started recording or not, but this whole drive to help other people, you know, that, that need for perfection and improving and reforming comes out of this heart and this desire to, to genuinely make things better and to help mm-hmm. other people. Because I, if I'm making a mistake, I really hope someone would tell me. So of course, I'm going to tell you if you're making one. <laughs> and other <laughs> right. people don't want to receive that or appreciate it. And just understanding how that was coming across and understanding how my need for those things and my complete lack of ability to do it ever was spilling out on the people around me. Mm-hmm. Um, it gave me such a different lens for how to approach my conversations or approach providing feedback for people who are working with me or under me. Um, and I love what they're saying about just kind of relationship with task mm-hmm. over people in marriage with kids. It's like I learned the Enneagram as my son was being born. So it's, I feel like he has such an advantage in our relationship with me being aware of how I approach him oh. being a kid growing up and will never be perfect <laughs> as much as I sure. would like him to be. And I feel like with Victoria, it's this idea. It's like part of me feels bad for the early years of our marriage where I just, I can see so clearly where my oneness was coming through um, in criticizing or judging or any of those things or trying to fix or improve her or our relationship. And at the same time, I'm so thankful for the gift of the Enneagram in knowing that, you know, once Joshua grows up and leaves home, I get her. And we Mm -hmm. have this amazing relationship because of the awareness that we now have of the way that we operate and inhabit the world. That's awesome. Well, let's dive into uh, the concepts of EIP. And so the first thing that we're going to dive into is the uh, misaligned wounded child. And then we're also going to address the aligned beloved child. So Beth, why don't you explain a little bit about what we mean by type one and their wounded child? Yeah. So when we talk about EIP, the first thing that we want to recognize is that we have that our main type with its core motivations that are driving why we think, feel, and behave. We have two parts in that main type. We have a wounded child and a beloved child. The wounded child forgets that we are Christ's beloved, even though we are, we forget and we operate out of this misalignment, which can hurt others. The wounded child feels like they're constantly hearing you've made mistakes or you're not perfect or you're not good enough in some form or capacity. And that can be really hurtful. And actually, it feels like condemnation and punishment and I have to obey the rules. And yet we can't completely. But there's this wounded part of our heart that fears hearing any more criticism because the inner critic is constantly berating them. And it's so... Uh, rigorous on the rules and following. And in fact, uh, ones believe um, until either I bring it up or someone brings it up that the inner critic is the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, uh, no, the Holy Spirit isn't critical and condemning, harsh, judgmental, um, sometimes chaotic all over the place. You know, the Holy Spirit is the fruits of the Spirit, right? So love, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, self-control, and I know I'm missing (laughs) one, Um, but what we see there is assurance, love, compassion, empathy, the Holy Spirit's moving towards us. It's not looking down at us and condemning and correcting us. And so I think that's a really big aha moment for type ones to recognize that when the wounded child is at play, it's really believing that this inner critic is the way they have to follow and they're not and they're bad. Um, And they feel like they're irresponsible. And I have to be the responsible one. If I'm if I'm responsible, then everything will calm down. The inner critic will calm down, and I'll finally get that message that I am good. I'm not making mistakes. So I would love for to hear from you guys, just kind of on that brief description. Again, in the last episode, we kind of went into a fuller description. But can you guys share with us a little bit more about what your wounded child feels like? Maybe like what the inner critic sounds like, how the inner critic is harmful and hurtful towards you, and then how it expresses itself outwardly in all your relationships. Brian, the look on your face says it all. Like it, it, it is there sounds that- very vulnerable <laughs> <laughs> and damaging. <laughs> Aww. Um, the inner critic has. I mean, just learning that it was there at all mm-hmm. and that it wasn't just me made me feel so not crazy. Oh, yeah. And I think growing up in church, 
And this was one of the biggest lessons for me is like the inner critic is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because for me, it was always the voice of God yelling at me to do better. And you did that wrong and you messed that up and you should have said that differently. And I think that was such a huge reason why I was so unable to relate to God or to receive his grace because I was like, but if you have, if there's grace for me, why do you keep yelling at me? Mm. And then it was discovering, no, that's actually your inner critic. That's just the enemy trying mm. to tell you that you're not good enough to receive it. And grace means you don't have to keep trying anymore. Mm. And it was so freeing. Um, and the way that it comes out is just every time I kind of give into it or listen a little too long to what the inner critic is saying, you know, you as ones, we kind of take that all upon ourselves and then for some reason think that we are the only ones who can fix it and we have right. to try really hard to do it and then we know we can't. So then we're frustrated and then it all spills out sideways on the people around us. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think knowing that was both so hurtful because <laughs> it's like, oh, this is true and so freeing because it was like, oh, but there's a way out. Uh, Brian, when you think about yourself as a little boy, like, have you had time to reflect on when you first started to experience your inner critic, self-criticism, judgment, and trying yeah, to be a good boy? Yeah, I think from the moment I knew how to recognize my own thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and it's I, a lot of that is layered in family history. I'm first-generation Korean-American, parents of immigrants. I'm the firstborn and oldest and only son in a family. Um, and within my generation, I'm the oldest um, so it carried a lot of inherent pressure, you could say. And then I was the son of a pastor, so I'm the pastor's kid and the oldest kid in the church. So that carries its own pressure. So I think for me, it was just all being compounded all on top of everything else. And I don't know that any of those things were ever communicated to me. I just carried them. I was like, yeah. oh, I must be the one responsible for everything. Yeah. I love that you say that because we talk about, uh, a lot of teachers will call it the wounded childhood message. And a lot of people think that that means it had to have been said directly mm -hmm. to them. So the wounded childhood message for the one would be, it is not okay to make mistakes. Yeah. Now, of course, I think in general, authority figures will say that in general, um, but we call it the interpreted childhood message because sometimes it was, uh, maybe we picked up a tone or a, a general sense of what our parents were saying and we, we filtered that through our type's mind and mm -hmm. then we were, we heard that message as if they had directly said it to us and feel very convinced that that everyone is saying this same exact message. So as a type one child, they're constantly thinking everyone around me is saying stop making mistakes or it's not okay to make mistakes. And I'm just trying so hard to hear that I am good. Um, and so I think that's really a key thing. And what you said is I don't think anyone was actually, no, sometimes parents are directly saying it. So we want to note that a lot of times aren't necessarily not saying that exact message, but we heard it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jill and Vanessa, what about you? Yeah. Well, what I was thinking um, is I, I come at it from a little bit of a different angle because I don't ever, I think what happened in my home of origin, um, which was a loving home, loving environment. Um, I mean, we, we were um, supported, but uh, accomplishment was what was rewarded. Mm -hmm. So so almost that message of um, you've got to be perfect is really more like when you do things well, that's when you get the affirmation. Sure. So I think that it was just uh, kind of covertly um, and it insinuated and and I picked up on that. So I'm like, oh, I want that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I will go after that. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, as far as the voice of God, I have never struggled with the voice inside my head being um, critical from God. That has mm -hmm. never... Um, I have always felt like his voice um, is loving. It is all of the things that, you know, the, the fruits of the awesome. spirit. <laughs> I haven't struggled with that. And I'm so grateful for that. But I think where um, the wounded child sometimes has shown up for me is more self-sufficiency. Mm. Um, so I forget to, um, that God's, 
power is available to me. And so I just go after it. And so I think that that has played out in that unhealthy side at times mm-hmm. of being self-sufficient and, um, or even, okay, God, this is what we're going to do instead of, um, what do you got for me, Lord? And I'm going to follow you. And so yeah. I think that that's the way it has played out for me more. Well, I love that because, and it goes back to what Vanessa was saying earlier, are you a one-to-one type one? Because that makes a lot of sense, a self-preservation type one. And I know some people are listening to this going, what is she talking about? There are three different instinctual subtypes for every type. Now we use all three, but um, for you, the one-to-one, the inner critic is going to be much more looking at the world and how imperfect the world is and being an ad, um, an an activist yes. and to reform. And so the inner critic isn't at the type one themselves in this in this scenario, it's outward. Whereas the self-preservation and the social is gonna be definitely inward and the social will be inward and outward. So those that are listening, they're like, oh, I wonder why hers is a little different. That would be why. And Vanessa's like, yep, that's why. Yeah. So I love the fact that you were able to say that so we can bring clarity because I think a lot of times people say, oh, well, I don't resonate with what he just said. And now you've given us a different perspective that really helps fill in some of those gaps. That's great. Well, why don't we move now to the idea of beloved? It's the part of us that uh, the spirit-filled self, it's the part that knows, believes, and trusts in all that Christ has accomplished for us. Um, Beth, why don't you explain what be- the beloved child, just a general description of what that is for the type one. Yeah, so uh, for type ones, the beloved child, they know who they are and whose they are. So this is that spirit-led self. And this is when they feel freedom from accusation and condemnation because they know that the burden has been placed on Christ and he has taken care of that burden. Not only has he removed our sins, he has put his righteousness on us and So then once the one recognizes, wait a second, when God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness. Therefore, he says you are good, not because I'm good, but because Christ is good. Therefore, the the very thing I long for, I already have in him. And there's this freedom and rest. And so what happens is the overflow of that heart position is that ones will radiate nobility, generosity, gentleness. Um, They're able to experience profound connections with others in leadership. Um, They're able to guide people with this um, amazing insights and wisdom that others might not naturally bring to the table. Um, And they can make a very safe place for people because at this place, like Jill, you had said earlier, you, when you get in brand and well, every, whatever you, when they get to this place, they feel the grace, they feel the mercy, they feel the kindness of Christ. And that same thing then overflows into the lives of others, uh, when they're with them. And then if other people make mistakes and they're in this place, they give that grace because they can see that they've been given grace by God. Um, and so it's just such a beautiful place for the type ones to be and to rest in. Um, Jill, you had mentioned this earlier in regards to your experience of the gospel as it relates to being a type one and moving from uh, unhealthy patterns to healthy. What was that like for you? Um, Well, you know, my motivation in that was because my marriage experienced a terrible, terrible crisis. And it... um, it was uh, in the midst of that crisis, a very dark year that my husband and I now talk very openly about. My husband had an affair mm-hmm. and left, and um, it was very, um, a very, very dark season. And it was during that dark season that I didn't know if my marriage was going to make it or not, but I knew that I needed to use this for a lack of a better word, this really crappy season as fertilizer Mm -hmm. in my life. (laughs) And so that's um, a very kind one way of putting it. (laughs) (laughs) I have other words, but uh, I'm a six. If this was the type eight eight panel, it would be definitely a little more colorful. (laughs) (laughs) And so I really, I mean, that's just where I began to look inward and take a look at, um, some of the the places that 
Um, I knew that I needed to grow, um, that mm. there were rough edges, um, that my judgment, my critical spirit was at play far more often than what I'd wanted to re to um, admit. And um, I'm so Jill, just curious, mm -hmm. what do you think would is the difference between the kind of individualistic, I'm going to reform myself versus addressing your critical spirit, but now with the help of the Holy Spirit, it seems like that's been a, a theme for all of you is that yes. asking for help. Mm. This like this wasn't just a an exercise in discipline and getting it right. Now all of a sudden the spirit of God is at play. What, yeah, that's surrender. What did that, how did it look different? Right. Well, I think that um, for me, I was at such a, a vulnerable, broken place that um, I didn't know what to do. And when you don't know what to do, it is the, you know, when that that's where faith uh, really wow. um, becomes real. And so um, that had I, to be so humbling to even to come to a place as a one that I don't know what the good is to do in this moment. No, I, I didn't have any idea. Um, but I believed I absolutely believe that God did. And so all mm -hmm. I could do was say, Lord, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Um, but I believe that you do know what to do and yeah. you're going to have to show me the next steps. And um, for a long time. Um, you know, at first I thought that was, that had to do with my marriage, but what I began to realize is that, um, really it had to do with my own personal growth. And so when my husband refused to go back to marriage counseling, I continued with the counselor and I began to dig into, um, that wounded place in me, um, the unrealistic expectations, the expectation of perfection, the critical spirit, um, not having a lot of grace and compassion. And many of those were things that my husband was actually kind of raising up against. And he had brought those to the table, but I had never, I had minimized to them. I had minimized them. And yeah. so I had to, I decided, well, whether my marriage makes it or it doesn't make it, I have some growth to do. And yeah. that's really where I began to um, have an understanding of those wounded places in me that needed some healing. And yeah. um, in our ministry, as we minister to marriages, uh, we call that um, our 1.0 self and our 2.0 self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, because we have now a 2.0 marriage that is made up of two 2.0 people. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so that's the yes. language we usually use, but, um, that really, I mean, honestly, it was just a really dark place for me that, uh, just really kind of forced me to begin to look at that. Yes. Mm. Well, Vanessa, what about you? Uh, what, how did you in, encounter grace and, the love and presence, kindness of God as it related to your own story? I think very similarly to Jill, I came, our marriage went through some really dark times as well. Uh, it was a four year dark period. And um, I really had to come to terms with parts of my woundedness that I had not been ready to face um, prior to, you know, what I would call like an undoing. And, and that looking at the particularities of some of the harm that had um, occurred to me, and then as an adult, some of the harm that I had caused, um, again, coming back to like not being profoundly and irreversibly screwed up, but that that was something that God could look, I could, God would come to where I was and would look me in the eye and say that everything about you matters to me. Like not just the things you do or you don't do, the things that have been done to you or that haven't been done to you, but everything about you matters to me. And that there was not, you know, I, was, I came of faith in a tradition that was taught very formulaically about God, 
that A plus B equals C. And what I was finding in my marriage at that time was that A plus B did not equal C. If I did this, mm-hmm. this, and this, it did not mean I had mm-hmm. a good or perfect or right marriage, right? And so there was a, a real wrestling with God uh, about that. And and what I love about um, you know Jacob wrestling with God mm-hmm. is that he doesn't relent. Uh, Jacob doesn't. And, but he does walk away with, like he walks with a limp for the rest of his life. Um, and that that limp also serves as a reminder of the nearness and how mm-hmm. close God was willing to draw to him, come toward him and draw near to him. And so I could then say, okay, I am, I am free to make mistakes. I'm actually, there's freedom in that, not to, to, not in like a licensure kind of way. I can just, you know, harm with impunity, but I'm free to mess up and other people are free to mess up and that that can actually be an invitation toward intimacy with the spirit of God, where I can come to the end of myself and I can discern you're not displeased with me. You're actually using this to draw me to yourself Um, because you care. You care about every, everything, every aspect about me. So, you know, it's really interesting um, because I have a really practical recent example of um, something that, that happened that I feel like in uh, the past, when I was more in a misaligned place, would not have handled well. Mm-hmm. But because I'm in a much um, more aligned uh, place with that beloved child, was able to handle well. Mm. Um, my my husband, two days ago, um, so we currently have our daughter's car. We've traded vehicles while they went on vacation. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did that so that some work could get done on the vehicle, their vehicle, and that we could just um, have the guy that does it come to our home and, and handle that. Um, but my husband lost the keys to the car. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. And, um, and so he had taken it for a drive and then he didn't know what he did with them afterwards. And we searched for 24 hours for those keys and we never could find them. And, um, in a, in a misaligned, uh, place or in my language, 1.0 place, um, (laughs) I would have been. Let me tell you, I would have been absolutely um, harping at Mark at mm-hmm. why he didn't put those keys in the right place. Um, mm-hmm. I would have been um, criticizing him and I would have been really focused on the things that I wanted. Like that particular day, I it was like 73 degrees and I am a huge, like when it is warm, I want to go take a long walk. And Mm. I had that in my mind that afternoon. I'm going to go enjoy the sunshine and take Mm. a long walk. But I couldn't. And it was gone. Because we had to search and search and search for these keys. You're going to take a long walk around the house. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep, exactly. But I was able to operate out of grace Um, I was able to operate out of an, I mean, truly an accepting heart that was Mm. like, you know what, this, I mean, it's, it, stuff like this happens. Life isn't perfect. And, um, Mm -hmm. and yes, I just bumped into my husband's imperfection. Um, but I can, I can handle that in a grace filled, loving way. Um, right. Because I see myself through God's eyes and therefore I can see my my husband and uh, what happened with this uh, through that lens of God's grace mm-hmm. and love. And um, we got to the end of that 24 hours. We had to call somebody to come and actually make a new key for the car. And you will not oh, you believe this, found it. but while they were making the new key for the car. <laughs> We actually looked down in between the deck steps and a flower pot, and there were the keys 
Yeah. And, um, but we, but we both marveled at, because we both were operating out of our aligned side and we both marveled at how we got, and that was really stressful. There were a lot of disappointments. There was a lot of emotion. There was a lot of frustration in that. I mean, my husband had just gone and he had rented a, um, he had gone to rent a sander because my, our son was helping us, uh, to refinish our deck, but the sander was stuck in the back of the van because the, the keys, we didn't have the keys to open it. (laughs) You guys, this was like a, this was like a comedy of errors. Okay. Yes. Yes. But bottom line, we got through to the end of that 24 hours and we weren't casting blame and we weren't angry with one another. And we, because we were both in that aligned beloved child place. Mm, And I love that. Jill, was was there, I know in some marriages we can almost start to predict or our bodies will sense like, was Mark waiting for critical Jill to show up? And were you waiting for Mm -hmm. minimizing Mark to show up? And Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And we even, we talked about that. Like we debriefed the whole situation afterwards. And both of us were like, I was so proud of you. Yeah, I was proud of you too. (laughs) And then we were like, and I was proud of myself too. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, there are some names that. for you. Uh, minimizing Mark and Judgy Jill. <laughs> so you can. There you go. That's good. I love it. Uh, that's the 1.0. That's, the that's 1. right. 0. That's yes. the 1.0. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to bring in our connecting parts and we'll start with the wings. These are the two numbers uh, adjacent to our main type. And for type ones, that's type two and type nine. Uh, type ones, the two part of us are part of you all is highly relational, can sense the needs of others. Um, it brings you more relational warmth and a desire to connect and help people. It's interesting hearing you guys uh, with that refrain that you're trying to help. Mm-hmm. That although people aren't re- may not be receiving it that mm-hmm. way, the intent is there. Uh, it supports your main type by encouraging you to roll up your sleeves and to serve and bring wisdom and to others in loving and practical ways. Uh, when our wing two is part is misaligned and trying to protect the wounded child, you may have noticed yourself uh, feelings of rejection or hurt when advice wasn't received well or even ignored, uh, fixating on others' needs, feelings, and imperfections without adequately addressing your own needs and wishing that people would return the favor and be equally responsible, helpful, and loving towards you. Yeah, so Beth, why don't you share uh, as just one brief example, and then I'd love to hear from our panel about uh, the two wing. Yeah, so as the beloved, your your beloved side, when you bring in that two part of your heart and you're trusting and knowing who you are in Christ, the two part of your heart is going to do some really amazing things for you as a type one. Um, It no longer needs to use the unhealthy strategies as the wounded child, but you're going to notice that you have this charitable interpretation of the behavior of others. So you're going to start to see that others are really trying their best. They might not be doing it right, but they're really trying. And so you can see that and encourage them along the way and give a lot of grace and compassion. Um, You also are going to maintain better boundaries by being able to say no and caring for yourself and others and not always carrying the responsibility baton, you know, like, okay, this isn't mine and I can actually let it go even if it doesn't get done. And that's really hard when the two part misaligned part comes in because the one's like, this is what's right. And the two's like, but we have to serve. But the beloved part says, you know, this, this is someone else's and I don't have to hold on to that. And so there's a lot more grace and freedom of actually doing what God is calling you all to do. Um, so what I would love to hear from you guys uh, real quickly is when does that two part show up in a misaligned way when I'm going to tell people what is right because I'm being helpful and then that aligned part that's like, you know what, I can you know give a lot of grace and encouragement um, while still being supportive and helpful to others. So kind of just share when these two, or when the type two wing shows up misaligned and aligned. Brian, why don't you go first? Yeah, I don't naturally access that 
part of me very often, but I have seen mm-hmm. where it instinctively jumps in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we were just talking in our family last night about the sheep and the goats passage in Matthew. We we have these little prayer cards we've been doing with Joshua. And we read them at dinner time, and it's about praying for the people on the fringes. You know, um, and I love the way the way the message version translates and says for those who are overlooked and ignored. Um, and Victoria and I have always felt like we are the people who look for those people on the outside or on the edges of our churches, our society, our groups, our friends, um, and to draw them in. And I think in a in an aligned way, it reaches out with compassion to those people just to see them and to help them. Um, and we've also had the unique an odd experience of planning and executing, completing whatever you want to call it, (laughs) a lot of funerals for our family and friends. Um, And I see the two side of me jump out like crazy when I'm in that situation. I just know that people are hurting, that there are things that they can't express or verbalize, and I just jump in and do it without Mm, needing to ask what's going on, just having a sense of what they're experiencing without experiencing it myself. Um, And being able to anticipate those needs to go out and just take care of the things that they don't know how to ask for. Mm -hmm. In a misaligned way, I've seen it where it's just the need for affirmation. (laughs) It's like, hey, does Mm -hmm. anybody love me? (laughs) Does anybody see me? Can I help you so that you can say thank you to me? Because that's really what I want. (laughs) I don't want to help you. I just want to hear thank you. Um, so good. And recognizing when that happens has been very helpful <laughs> to, to it. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's like, hey, I'm my heart needs a little affirmation. Let me just ask for right. it directly instead of trying to manipulate someone else into the situation. Yeah. Uh, some, a lot of times when I hear people talk about their wings, you, you can sense the ambivalence. If a one is trying to be independent, not dependent on others, and yet there's this to part of your heart that says, I need your affirmation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, for me, I think that the the two wing uh, plays out in taking on too much responsibility. And um, that's the negative side or the um, wounded child side, um, because I, I am so hyper responsible yeah. that um, it... I have overworked myself and um, said yes to entirely too much. And so um, that I would say as I've gotten healthier and, um, and really embrace that beloved side, I've learned how to say no and not feel bad about it. Like to recognize that that's actually healthy and um, that it's just as important that I say no, mm-hmm. as it is that I say yes mm-hmm. uh, to things at times. And so I think that that has probably been one of the biggest ways that 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 part of me, that that wing um, mm-hmm. plays out. But I would say um, for me, probably the nine is more of a dominant wing than the two. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. All three of you are feeling right. that way. Yeah. Well, that's well, a great segue. That's right. So why don't we jump in on the type nine wing or type nine part of the one's EIP. Uh, the type nine part is non-judgmental and uh, does not want to have disagreements with loved ones or feel angry, upset, or disturbed. It supports the type one's main type by encouraging you to be kind, patient, and peaceful towards not only others, but also yourself in counteracting your inner critic and to bestow the same grace that you give to others upon yourself. And when your nine part is misaligned and trying to protect your wounded child, you may actually notice yourself being less aware of how you feel or what you're passionate about because you're so focused on what is right and wrong, ignoring or suppressing feelings of anger and irritation so that you can keep peaceful connections with others uh, and be seen as good. Uh, quietly digging in your heels and becoming stubborn until the other person gives in to your correct way of doing things. What? (laughs) Us nines don't get (laughs) stubborn. I was about to say nine. I was trying to say nines aren't stubborn, but uh, it came. It was going to come out as Beth's not stubborn to anyone else. Yes, we are Um, very stubborn. (laughs) Well, how about I'll I'll, I'll shift it it into the positive. How is this? Anytime nine comes up, like it's all about Beth now. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know. It's all about me. No, it's okay. as a nine, that would be like the worst thing. It's like, no, don't focus on me. 
Um, okay, so for you guys, when the type nine is more in the beloved state, you're going to find uh, so many really enriching things for your type one personality coming out. So you're going to be more kind and compassionate, understanding and gracious, not only towards others, but yourself as well. You're going to be able to hear the Holy Spirit not the inner critic that berates you and others. You're going to be able to see past that um, and correct it and to be able to have that non-judgmental response to others. You can be more adaptable, accommodating, easygoing, um, and, and stating what you need in a way that is not manipulative, you know, just being more direct, but soft at the same time. And you're going to be able to mediate and harmonize groups while seeing that the best way forward is is lived out so like wisdom and insight you guys are going to bring that but in a way that others feel receptive to it they're not going to be like oh that kind of hurt that's a little sting or that's a little jab or criticism you're going to bring it with a lot of warmth so can you guys share with us when the type nine shows up in a misaligned and aligned way for you guys yeah i find it really interesting that two out of the four if you will wounded parts Ha, for type one have withdrawing tendencies right. or stances, right? So the law of averages <laughs> <laughs> makes me more familiar with withdrawing uh, in places of misalignment. And so for me, in that not, with the nine wing, I see the wounded part almost as a digression. I see it the most in my marriage. Like if my spouse and I reach an impasse in the midst of an argument, I'm the one who's going to withdraw from the conversation, or I'm the one who's going to call a timeout. And it takes a great deal of effort to really, as you said, Jill, press into the emotions that I would rather avoid, like hurt or loneliness. So much of that is deeply and storied in my childhood as well, right? But I would rather deny those feelings altogether um, and just arrive at the right course of action rather than put forth the energy to really understand what's going on with me below the surface. So you can, all, you can kind of see the marriage dance there as well. But unless I or my spouse interrupt that digression, eventually I'm the one who's like silently seething in anger <laughs> and closing drawers really loudly in like passive aggressive ways that are so much like a moody teenager that it's really quite comical. Mm. Um, but that's, you know, that's how I know, oh, this is a wounded part. It mm -hmm. feels really young. It feels really young. Yes. Yeah. And then, and I would say on the beloved side, my nine week comes out more with parenting. Mm -hmm. When I feel like I can be present and patient with my nine-year-old and my seven-year-old who butt heads mm -hmm. like nobody's business. One is going to come to me and tell me something that the other one's doing or I'll heal something or, hear someone scream. And um, in those moments where I feel most grounded in myself, I can like stop what I'm doing, take the time to like pull you guys, both of you in and be like, okay, you tell me what happened over here. And you tell me what happened over here. And how did that make you feel? And what did you want to do? Right. And what, you know, how are you processing that? And you can, did you talk to one another about this? And we're going to actually come to a place where we're uh, modeling and practicing for them what it actually looks like to mediate a conversation and feel like the other person has airspace and I get my time too. And we can be generous with one another in that and reach a compromise that everybody's happy with yes. and that everybody walks away feeling like, oh, I felt seen and I felt heard. Okay, Brian. So I'm yeah. going to force you into telling us when Beloved 9 yeah. shows up. So Beloved it definitely does because I nine. see it. Oh, absolutely it does. And I think... For me, it's one of the biggest transformations I've seen in myself since learning the Enneagram, where my default nature would be to be critical and judgmental of anyone's opinion other than mine. Yeah. The healthy, aligned, beloved nine side of me is like, oh, I totally see where you're coming from. I can hear your point of view and respect it and acknowledge it and make room for it at the table and not have to be right about this situation. Um and my wife has really helped me on that too. It's like, she'll just push me on questions and say, like, is this really the hill you want to die on? <laughs> and I'll just be like, no, you're probably right. I don't. So let's just let it go. Uh -huh. um, and I think I'd that's probably really be a little helpful. more sarcastic and say, yes, I'm going <laughs> to die on this hill. 
<laughs> Sometimes yeah. I do, uh, yeah. but not the aligned side of me. Um, yeah. And I think it's it's that part of wanting to be more inclusive and draw more people in rather than to set myself up as the authority or the right one or any of those things. And the aligned beloved nine wing of me helps me to make that kind of room and space for others. Yes. Well, guys, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move into the last two parts. And these are where your your main type is connected by those lines to the two other parts. And we actually call it at, at your Enneagram coach, Enneagram paths, because they're the paths you take to those two numbers. Um, and so for the type ones, you have a type four part of you and a type seven part. Um, so type ones, when your four part uh, shows up, it lives primarily in imaginations and feelings, and it has this idealized vision of what could be or what needs to be or what it longs for, but it feels that there's something tragically flawed or missing inside them. And so the four part of your heart is wanting uh, depth and understanding and to be authentic. Um, but as we also know from the type one, they kind of want to shut off those emotions. It feels very vulnerable to go there. So what you might find this kind of combination of being a one, but accessing this four part when you're misaligned, you might start to feel resentful and angry that expectations aren't being done by others and that you feel very misunderstood. Like, why isn't, why aren't people listening, and understanding me? And again, like you said, Vanessa, withdrawing, becoming moody, temperamental, um, kind of can seep out as well. Um, and then you might daydream about being free from all these responsibilities that no one else seems to want to take off your shoulders and get away somehow. Um, but then the aligned beloved part of your heart as a t uh, when you move towards that type four is that you're going to be able to kind of withhold judgment, making room for other people to be authentic, to express their emotions, to be raw, to be real, and to set aside those to-do lists so that you can experience the beauty of life and the present moment, but then also see the beauty of emotions and the wide range of emotions as Jesus Christ himself displayed. So can you guys share with us a little bit of when that misaligned and aligned part of your type four uh, comes up? I would say... It shows up less as moodiness, mm -hmm. but it's almost a moodiness that goes on inside my yeah, head. Sure. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I do a lot of ruminating versus when I'm in an aligned place, I feel like I'm able to be more present because when I'm misaligned, I'm either looking at the past or the future. But when I'm in, in an aligned place, it's like I'm able to put those in their proper places so that I'm not ruminating over past hurts, past wounds, um, past places where I feel like I was unfairly treated um, or even future of I've got too much on my plate or I've got, you know, I'm worried about these things and I'm able to be, to put those in their proper place to get, and really putting them in the hand, hands of God to go, Lord, I can't do anything about that, but you can. You are the one who judges justly. Um, it, you know, that's, I think it's in Second Peter that says that you are the one that judges justly. And, um, and so I could put it in his hands. Um, why am I worrying about tomorrow? Um, you know, there's all kinds of, of uh, scripture on, on that. And I put that in its proper place. And then I can be fully present in the moment. That's great. Love that. Love, love, love that. Vanessa, what about you? On the beloved side, something that really birthed during the pandemic for me is uh, I took up art journaling and watercolor painting. And so there's this great company that has monthly subscription boxes that come with all the supplies you need for several projects. They include step-by-step -step instruction cards for different techniques and these video tutorials to follow along, which is pretty great for me because it gives me rules, but I get to bring my own creative expression to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to like use the brain space to envision a concept. So that has been a place to not only like process my feelings and an outlet, but also to just slow down. I can get really going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Right. And for me, it's a way to be present. And my seven-year-old daughter joins in. She loves it. If I start pulling out art supplies, she'll sit with me. Mm. Um, That's awesome. And then I would say also um, spiritual direction and story work are places that have 
really allowed me to leave space for people's unfiltered and really raw emotions. I can let go and just be present with an individual and I can ask curious questions. I can let them explore what's coming up for them in their own bodies or what God might be speaking to them. And there's so much room for the way that God shows up in in unique individual ways in people's lives. That's not something I feel the need to critique with or mess with as it is. It's just such sacred and holy ground. That's great. What do you um, want to take us into type seven? Yep, that sounds great. So for type ones, the other path is type seven. Uh, this part of them can be upbeat, fun, happy. It sees life. Uh, as some have described it cotton candy, <laughs> super sweet to the taste, but it disappears quickly. Um, and, and <laughs> it, it's leaving things unsatisfied, and we're always wanting more. It supports the type one's main type by giving them opportunities to break free from their responsibilities and the demands of their inner critic. So they can enjoy all life has to offer. And when our type seven part is misaligned and trying to protect our wounded child, uh, type ones may notice that they become more demanding, that others meet their needs, uh, criticisms and desires. Perhaps uh, they're trying to find escape hatches from their inner critic, actually, yeah. and other responsibilities to distract themselves from the ongoing pressures that they face. Well, avoiding feelings of pain and sadness or disappointment, or they may find themselves reframing a negative situation in order for it to sound more positive. Um, Beth, why don't you share a little bit more about what that the type seven part of the type one's EIP, what does that look like? Yeah. So when they're moving towards that beloved side, man, the seven part of their heart uh, brings joy. It creates um kind of uh, self-sustaining abundance in their heart that overflows into the life of others. Um, what you find is they have a lot more enthusiastic and spontaneous, playful and joyful um, side of their heart that comes out and they're able to see the world um, kind of in the childlike way. I think a lot of times type ones, they're so afraid of being childish and like lacking responsibility but I'm always like, no, you want to be childlike, you know, see the world and the circumstances from this optimistic lens. And this can be really challenging for the type ones, um, but it's such a beautiful growth place for them. Um, so a lot of times what I'll tell type ones, like in a growth path is, hey, I want you to start scheduling in your calendar spontaneous time. And that sounds weird because spontaneity should be spontaneity, but Type ones, that's really hard to do. So if you put in your calendar like a half an hour here or an hour there or half a day here or half a day there and you just block it off and then you're going to decide what to do in that time as it comes, it helps them to learn what that spontaneity can feel like and the joy and the playfulness that can come about. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how type ones can move in that beloved space and to experience the joy and the abundance that sevens can uh, feel as well. So guys, tell us a little bit more about the uh, when the misaligned and the aligned type seven um, kind of influences you as a type one. I don't know, Jill and Vanessa, about you, but I generally tend to feel very shut off from my feelings. Um, yes. Because I am so logical, because I am so task-oriented, I don't often make room for feelings. So when I'm able to do that and sit with those, um, it is such a gift. You know, Jeff and you and I were having a conversation a while ago about uh, the voice of the heart by Chip Dodd, and it's been so helpful just to get through that. I know it's so <laughs> good. I, I and think just when I, I think right you now. even responded like, "Hey, I need to get some emotions." What's the title of that book again? <laughs> that was it. And it was just like, I don't, I don't know what to call them. I've got mad, yeah. sad, glad, and you know, whatever. Mostly mad. <laughs> and so I'm being able to mad. tease those out and and yeah. recognize what they are has been such a gift. Um, That's great. Rather than just wallowing in self-pity or you know this part of me is missing again it's just like no there's a depth and there's a realness and there's a gift of emotions and recognizing i'm feeling these things because something is missing so what is that and where does it actually get fulfilled rather than me sitting with a bowl of cheese balls right um <laughs> the path to seven is wonderful and that's what i call vacation mode brian right it's like uh -huh. when the responsibilities get turned off and i'm so much more happy <laughs> and easy to be around and spontaneous and fun rather than buttoned up and like, hey, these are the things that need to get done or hey, don't distract me right now. Um, and it's been so wonderful to see that and to be able to experience it. And then knowing that it's there as a resource for me, 
to recognize when I am feeling a little bit too wound up. It's like, you know, I probably need a break. (laughs) I'm going to go for a drive, get a coffee, go on a bike ride or something. Where I see the misaligned behavior of a seven is in those same places where when I'm feeling too overwhelmed or backed into a corner, I look for an escape hatch. Mm. And it's like, oh, there must be a way out of this. Or how can I reframe this and make a Mm -hmm. really lovely thing out of something that's a really horrible situation just so my mind doesn't have to sit with it. Um, and I think the escape hatch mentality has been, you know, it's popped up in my life more than I care to admit. Um, but now seeing that it's there helps me to be able to reframe it in a healthy way to say, okay, now what is the, what is the actual good I can see out of a really hard situation that I'm in so that I don't, that I don't stay there (laughs) so that I don't feel trapped so that I don't end up in my unhealthy misaligned for behavior as well. Um, And it's been such a gift to see the depth of all of these things. And Vanessa, like you said earlier about, instead of being caught in a box or put in a box, to have all these other resources available to us has been such a gift. Oh, thanks, Brian. That's so, so helpful. So now that you know all the parts of a type one TIP, it's helpful to visualize them as kids on a bus. Mm -hmm. And let me explain that a little bit further. (laughs) When your beloved child is driving the bus, all of your parts are aligned with the truth of the gospel, and they can relax and trust the driver. Uh, But when our beloved child disengages by going to the back of the bus to sleep, your wounded child and other parts will panic, and they use their strategies to grab at the steering wheel of life. They're doing their best to help you, but they're ill-equipped to take on this leadership role. They need the beloved child to awaken, get back in the seat, and to lead them towards the truth of the gospel. The good news is that the more your wounded child and parts feel seen, heard, and cared for by your beloved child, the more that they will trust you. It's here that your whole heart will experience the kind of true commitment and satisfaction because the beloved child guides you into the arms of Jesus every time. Yeah. So in our last episode, you know, we shared a lot of practical ways to integrate um, a type one's EIP into your daily life for, so you guys can grow. So definitely check that out. Um, now, for all the types, um, getting to know your wounded child is really important. But we want to recognize that they're, the wounded parts of our heart are trying their best to help us. They're just ill-equipped. So we don't want to condemn them or berate them or shame them. We want to come alongside and understand and care for them and by bringing the gospel back into um, alignment with our heart. So that's really important. And so, you know, getting to know your wounded child, a lot of times we suggest naming that part of your heart so that you recognize and acknowledge their presence and their history. You know, just naming something says, yeah, I see you and I, I, I name that you have a part and a place in my in my life. And same with the beloved child. So we name our parts and it helps us to kind of um, communicate more clearly. Or you can just say my, you know, my wounded uh, child is showing up or my beloved or my mm-hmm. type, whatever part is showing up. Whatever it does to help you to communicate more clearly with others and how to use these parts and how to keep each other um, back in alignment is so, so helpful. So I want to thank our guests and for you joining us as our audience members today. And we've learned so much about type ones. Yeah. If you have a type one in your life or you know people who love them, please share this episode with them. Uh, what we did today with our type ones is Enneagram coaching. And we'd love for you to personally experience this. You can do that by connecting with one of our certified Enneagram coaches. They can help you move your Enneagram knowledge from your head and into your heart where true transformation can begin. You can find a coach that fits you best at myenneagramcoach.com. That's myenneagramcoach.com. And to learn more about your EIP, you can pre-order our new book, More Than Your Number, wherever you buy books. Mm -hmm. And we want you guys to join us next week when we discover more about our type twos that we know and their EIP. But as always, please remember that the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It is the gospel that transforms us. Thanks for joining us.